So what are the requisites for the digital revolution? Well, it all starts with the tangible technological infrastructure of digital technologies. The most traditional technological infrastructure is the fixed line phone. Yes, you remember that? Uh, fixed line telephones, these were the initial portals also to the internet. We accessed the internet through fixed line phones. Being very honest with you, I personally in my life, I never had a fixed line phone. I mean, when I grew up in my parents' house, but for me personally, I, I never had one. I don't know if you have one. You can see also that in the entire world, fixed line telephony actually decreased. Around the year 2005, it reached a penetration of 20%. That means there were 20 fixed line phones per 100 people. That's also kind of like enough because if you have one fixed line phone per household and there are five people in the household, that's enough. You don't need more than one in five. Um, but now actually it went down to 15 from 20 fixed line phones per 100 people to 15 fixed line phones per 100 people. So fixed line telephony usage actually decreased. And it was replaced by two different things, by internet access and especially mobile telephony. We can see that nowadays around 40%, you could say almost half of humankind is using the internet, which also means that half of humankind does not use the internet. And mobile telephony, that's most impressive. There are 95, 96 mobile telephony subscriptions in the world per 100 people. This is so impressive because electricity, for example, only reaches 80% of humankind. So there are parts of the with mobile phones you can find in every little corner of the world. There are more mobile phones in the world than there is actually physical access to electricity. Mobile phones are considered the fastest diffusing technology in the history of humankind. Now, these are global averages here, which hide many details. For example, these 40% of internet penetration um, is an average between, in Europe, 80% of the population uses the internet, and in Africa, only a little bit more than 10% of the population uses the internet. So this 40 is actually an a very coarse grained average, but in average, we could say, well, almost half, almost half means that, well, most people in the developed world do, and in the developing world, only 10 out of 100 people are actively using the internet, which are basically the super, super rich uh, in these countries. Now, having access to the internet, doesn't tell you anything about how good this connection is. Um, most people of the world actually have access through a narrowband connection, not a broadband connection. That means they have access to less than 256 kilobits. That's less than a quarter uh, of a mega uh, bit connection. And you can see that broadband, fixed broadband, only reaches 10% of humankind. The main culprit for that is that broadband is very expensive. The global goal is to bring the price of broadband down to less than 5% of the income of a society, of the average income. So in the United States, let's say you would earn $1,000 per month. 10% uh, of that is $100 and 5% of it is $50. So if you earn $1,000 per month, the broadband should cost $50 or less. You can find offers in the United States for broadband for $50 or less. So uh, we achieved that actually the income in the United States is not $1,000 per month, month. The average income is rather like $5,000 per month. So we comfortably uh, in the United States are over uh, this, this global goal. However, this goal is only fulfilled in half of the world's countries. In many, in, in the other half, broadband costs more than 5%. Actually, on the other extreme, there are some countries in the world where broadband costs twice as much as people earn, <laughs> 200%. It doesn't mean that broadband costs $10,000, but it means that in these countries, people have a monthly income on average, maybe of $50, and broadband costs $100. That's still twice as much as people earn on average, and it's just impossible 
to get broadband if it costs twice as much as you earn. So there's a big challenge to bring the price of broadband down. And that's why broadband, fixed broadband especially, is still so little diffused uh, throughout the world. Now, a big hope here is mobile broadband. You can see here that one in three people already has access to mobile broadband. So we use our mobile phone to access the internet, the high-speed internet. And you can remember only a few years ago, the mobile phone was mainly a device to talk for voice communication. You can see until the year 2009, you can see these orange bars is the voice traffic through the phone worldwide. And you can see until the year 2009, people used their mobile phones mainly for voice. And then these blue bars are, is data traffic. And that suddenly took off. And now the orange bars here is data traffic. You can see that we mainly use our phones for data traffic as a portal to the internet. We watch videos on our phone and we also use the internet to make voice calls through Skype or WhatsApp and so forth. So actually the mobile phone converts itself into the most important access portal to high-speed internet throughout the world. So as a quick summary, we can say that some people are already connected to the digital realm and other people not. This fact is often referred to as the digital divide, the divide between those that are already involved in the digital age and those that are still excluded. Now, there are many dimensions to this digital divide. We already said that probably rich people have it easier to access because the technology costs something. But there are many other dimensions we can look at. For example, this graph shows us something about the relation between internet usage and the educational degree in Brazil. Now, one of the side goals of this course is that we constantly try to read some graphs. You can read graphs and graphs are very important. They are everywhere now. So it's important for you to start really taking time and reading graphs. For example, also on television, news reporters uh, read graphs all the time on their displays. Between you and me, many of them, they have no idea how to read a graph well. So it's important for us that we start to really read graphs and make sense of them. Graphs tell a story. So have a look at this graph and see if you can read the basic message that it wants to tell us. Income and degree of education are only two dimensions. There are many other ways we can look at who accesses the digital realm and who does not yet. This graph, for example, shows us a divide between urban and rural households and fixed and mobile ways of accessing digital technology. Um, let's see if you can read that graph. It's a little bit more complicated. Have a close look. So first of all, you always look at the legend of the graph. You can see here that we have urban fixed solutions and urban mobile solutions. And here you have rural household with fixed solution and rural household with mobile solution. And then we can see if we can find some kind of pattern. It's basically a pattern recognition task, uh, as you did in the previous exercise. Uh, but this pattern is not so obvious. If you take a very close look, you can see that the urban access always has a downward pattern and the rural access has this kind of upward pattern. That means that in the urban households, we have more fixed than mobile. In a rural household, we have more mobile than fixed solutions to access digital technology. Why could that be? And there are many more perspectives from which we can look at who uses and who doesn't use digital technology. Besides income, education, geography, we have age, for example, as well. Here you have different countries, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Trinidad, Tobago, and Chile. Um, have a look, what does this graph simply tell you? And that's a very common pattern that we can find with many different digital technologies. Here we have, for example, the use of iPhones and Androids and how people use them for gaming and video watching through YouTube. And you can see that the younger generation, up to 35 years, they use their phones a lot for gaming and video watching and the older generation a little less. 
However, I personally, I find it still impressive. Check that out. 3% of the grandma and grandpas who are more than 65 years old, they use their iPhone for gaming. <laughs> I, I found that pretty cool once I, once I found that out. So takeaway basically is the digital divide can be looked at at many different dimensions. There are many more to them. And a very important first thing to look at when we think about the digital age is to consider which kind of technological, tangible infrastructure do we have and who is using it. Now that's not sufficient, but it's absolutely necessary, a necessary first building block of the digital age.